Okay, up next we have Eric Wall. I'm pretty excited to hear his talk. Um, you know, first heard of Eric when he was the altcoin slayer in 2017 by taking apart uh, a lot of the outlandish claims ba made by some altcoins. Um, and I am pretty excited about social slashing as a feature that allows us to help keep this space decentralized. And Eric's really been a leader on this, so I'm really excited to welcome him to the stage. Welcome, Eric. If we allow censorship of user transactions on the network, then we basically failed. This is the hill that I'm willing to die on. If we start allowing users to be censored on Ethereum, then this whole thing doesn't make sense, and I will be leaving the ecosystem. And I think there are a lot of people that think the same thing. Powerful words by Ethereum developer Marius van der Weyden. By the way, do you know that 50% of transactions, actually 50% of the blocks in Ethereum right now are being censored? They're OFAC compliant. Who here in this audience recognizes this image? Can I see a raise of hands? What if I say the name Shaolin Fry? Does that ring a bell? Okay, there are very few hands. This is one of the most important symbols in Bitcoin's history. And it tells a story that I think that every crypto per cryptocurrency person should know. So let me tell you a little story. So it's winter in 2017, the end of February. Bitcoin is trading at around $1,000. And for the first time in Bitcoin's history, the blocks are full. The mempool is full. There are rumors that there's transaction totaling 900,000 Bitcoin stuck in the, in the transaction queue. Now there is a, an upgrade, there's a code that's dormant in the code base that has, that includes a, a solution to this problem. Segregated witness has been deployed on the network, but it hasn't been activated. So this is a soft fork style upgrade, and it's configured to activate after 95% of the Bitcoin mining hash rate signals their support for the upgrade. It's, it's the same upgrade process that the last three soft fork has used for the last couple of years. But this time, the upgrade isn't getting support. We've been stuck in this deadlock situation and we're not getting anywhere. We know that with 51% hash rate, we can break the deadlock, like the miners can do it if they want to. Um, but we're not even close to 51%. So we're in a deadlock. Then out of nowhere comes this unknown, relatively unknown developer and posts an email on the Bitcoin developer mailing list where he explains that you know, this signaling met methodology that we're using, it's a misinterpretation. The software rules are actually always enforced by the nodes, not the miners. So what, what this felt like, by the way, this is called a user activated software. This is an important phrase to, to remember. So what this felt like is basically like, imagine that you're a baby and you're drowning in a very shallow pool and then your mother reach, reaches in her arm and teaches you that actually you're not drowning, you can just stand up, you just use your legs, your, your head will be above the, above the water. So we call it the, um, the Independence Day in Bitcoin. It's the, um, it's the day where Bitcoiners took a front seat in, in the car that's driving the upgrades. And you can argue that Bitcoiners weren't really sovereign users when they believed that they were at the behest of miners' will, the, the will of miners, to determine which upgrades make it into the protocol. So this is 
really important, uh, really important event in Bitcoin's history. And this is a bit cliche, this image, but really what I think happened is that we create these structures, these governance structures in blockchains, where we believe that those governance structures that we create are the only ways that we can ch change the network. But many times they're just there out of convenience. There's the only thing that is in control is the market. You can create new rules, and if you get the market to follow you, then you can set new rules. So you don't have to abide by these structures that were created for ourselves. So we did this in Bitcoin. We were successful at it. So the, the uh, one thing to recall, though, here is that right before this soft fork got activated by the users setting an activation date in their node software, the miners actually fell in line. So the miners did what we wanted them to because we forced them, forced their hand by showing them that if they don't abide, then, then we'll just implement the soft fork ourselves, and they have to create blocks that abide by those validity rules. So the actual, the actual outcome matrix in this situation was rather complex. I don't want to brush over uh, user-activated softworks and say that they're like a super simple thing. They're actually quite complex, and you can run into scenarios where there's chain splits and there's replay attacks between those forks. So it's something that you've got to implement with care, and you've got to be strategic about it. But the overall like, takeaway, the conclusion from this is that Block producers are merely, merely servants of the protocol, and we don't ultimately have to abide by how they act. So this story has this sort of um, Cinderella quality or like a David and Goliath quality to it, where the little man stands up against the big corporations. Um, and it's something that really galvanized the Bitcoin community. And I think that it is time that we see this type of galvanization happening also in the Ethereum community, because the Ethereum protocol is facing a threat that is perhaps much bigger than the one that Bitcoin faced. So let's go back in history and talk about the uh, three greatest threats, in my opinion, that has faced the Ethereum protocol. So June 2016, the DAO hack. This, is, was, one, this was when uh, Ethereum's immutability came at risk. And then September the same year, the Shanghai DDoS attacks. This is when Ethereum's availability, the uptime of Ethereum, came under stress. And then we have just the two months ago in August, I don't know exactly what to call this event, but I've decided to call it the, um, the OFAC OFAC. <laughs> and this is when the neutrality of Ethereum came at risk. Now, just a quick recap, you remember this, of course. Um, in August, the uh, Treasury Department puts contract addresses to Tornado Cash on the OFAC sanctions list. And on the 10th of August, Alexei, Alexei Pertsev gets jailed. And what happened then was that this, this avalanche of compliance that started to threat the Ethereum network where we would see front ends um, uh, implementing wallet screening, uh, which is fine, it's just the front ends, right? The, if the front ends decide to uh, censor users, that's, that's okay, right? But it, uh, so we saw, for example, Anthony uh, Sassano and Justin Sun. By the way, shout out, to, uh, shout out to David Hoffman, who's actually suing the Treasury Department. Yeah. <laughs> he was also one of those guys that got his wallet, his wallet dusted and is also, was also unable to use Aave because of that. Uh, but uh, it didn't stop there. Like We found out a couple of days later that Flashbots were censoring transactions and had been doing it for quite some time also. So we now feel like the, the noose around our neck is getting tighter and tighter. Now we even see censorship happening at the block building level. And then the sort of death knell, the, the, the worst possible thing is when we see that even the base layer validators, so the, the block producers, so this is Ethermine, the, I think it's the largest, it was the largest mining pool in Ethereum. Even they refuse to implement, uh, sorry, they refuse to include uh, tornado cash transactions because of their interpretation of, of the OFAC law. And this is the worst possible thing that can happen, right? When our validators are afraid to include transactions because the US government doesn't want them to. And amidst this, we had this now infamous tweet by Brian Armstrong where, so Coinbase was at this point in time uh, 
going to be the largest, uh, single largest validator on the Ethereum network after the merge. And he puts out this tweet where it says, well, hopefully it's obvious, but we're going to follow the law, which is fine, but it's not super great to have your largest validator basically saying that we're kind of feels like they also feel like they might, may have to, to comply with OFAC. So with the merge, we sort of went from this situation where we had hash rate from all over the globe connecting to these mining pools. And now after the merge, we had this situation where the largest, the largest block producers are single companies in, in regulated jurisdictions like Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance. And if you look at how many blocks they make per an epoch, each epoch has 32 blocks. Coinbase makes six, Binance makes one, Kraken makes three, that's 10, 10, 11 in total. That's actually enough to create serious damage uh, and censor the, the Ethereum network if they, if they wanted to. So I saw, the, I saw these images looking at the, um, uh, the, the, the live stream for this event, where two paths are being described, and we have proof of work here on the uh, left-hand side, censorship, centralization, but it's, I mean, I'll be the first one to admit, I don't know how you guys feel, but the, um, the transition to proof of stake did bring, I, I mean, it did bring us closer to having the neutrality of the platform endangered. And I've, I used to think that, like, Crypto, Ethereum, Bitcoin, it's this amazing movie that we get to watch from a front row seat. But at this moment, I felt like I wanted to, I wanted to scream at the screen. Because we always used to say, like this is, a, this is a blog post by Vitaly from years ago. We used to say that the um, harder to, uh, harder to de detect attacks like censorship, a coalition centering, if that happens, we can coordinate a min minority user activated soft work which, uh, in which the uh, attacker's funds are once again largely destroyed. So this was, always, this was always the plan that we would do this in this type of situation. Um, Patrick McCory has this beautiful imagery where he describes, so what, what, what Vitalik is really getting at is that in the Ethereum protocol, you can selectively target specific validators and punish them individually based on their actions. And we do have a track record of what they're doing, right? So in proof of stake, you can, there's uh, the, the actions that they do are actually uh, attributable because uh, they got to put their signatures on specific blocks when they're testing. You don't have that quality in proof of work. So, it, so in proof of stake, you actually have a superpower. We have a mechanism that allows us to selectively target specific validators, and if we can detect that they are engaging in a censorship attack on the network, we can coordinate a soft work that punishes, punishes those specific validators individually, and we don't have to blow up the entire network, which we have to do in proof of work, if we want to change the proof of work uh, function, for example. So I got I to gotta mention this. I feel like I have to talk about this. There's, you've seen, I think most of you have probably seen this graphic where 50% of the uh, blocks in Ethereum are currently OFAC compliant. Is this a problem? Yeah, I think it's a big problem. So what should we do? Like, should we slash every single validator who's registered with an OFAC compliant MEV boost relay? I, f I feel like we have to separate between, between two separate issues here. So one thing that's very important to remember is what is the reason that flashbots exists? So there's censorship in the network can happen at two different levels, or actually three, there's, there's more levels, but the two main ones is in the block construction process and then also at the validator level. The current censorship that we're seeing in the network is in this red box here, in the MEV boost portion. So you have to remember, what was the, what was the reason that flashbots exist? Well, it's because what if in Ethereum there's only one validator that's really, really good at extracting MEV? If there's only one validator that's really, really good at extracting MEV, they are going to be able to provide much higher staking yields than anyone else. And then you're going to see, so let's imagine that's Coinbase, for example. Let's ma imagine that Coinbase is really good at this. Well, then you get a much higher yield if you delegate your stake to Coinbase versus, for example, staking on your own. This is why Flashbots exists. It's because they're, they're allowing any validator to mine, uh, to, to make blocks as if they were Flashbots, if they, if, as if they had access to Flashbots MEV extraction techniques. So what Flashbots is doing is allowing 
validators to not have to re-delegate their stake to someone else, but still be able to mine these very profitable blocks. So they are preserving validator level decentralization in the system. Now it's come at an awful cost, right? It's come at the cost at, that, they, that they are now OFAC compliant and they're building these uh, uh, blocks that everyone's using, they're relaying these blocks. And this is a terrible thing, but it, at, least we have the, at least we have the opportunity here that validators can use other relays. And there are technical ways that we can, uh, so basically before the merge, Flashbot's only used to create a portion of the blocks. So we can go back to such a model, we can use PBS, we can use inclusion lists, uh, we can use partial block auctions, and we can go back to a model. There are technical solutions to this specific problem, uh, which we're in now where Flashbots are creating these entire blocks, and if Flashbots is, is censoring, censoring that, that also then applies to the validator. But at least we're in a situation where validators can use other relays, and we can implement these technical solutions that force uh, MEV uh, builders to include certain transactions. So there's a solution to that. Uh, whereas if all the stake was centralized in Coinbase hands and they start to centering, well, that's a much worse problem, right? So this is why I'm not going out on Twitter and saying, let's slash all the, val all the validators that's using Flashbots. What, I'm, what I think we gotta do is we gotta explore these technical solutions to reduce the impact that the uh, MEV relays and the MEV builders has. There's a, there's a way for us to dig ourselves out of the hole that we're currently in. So let's talk about the, the, the more pernicious problem here, which is what if the validator, so, so even, if, even if we um, uh, have a bunch of different relays that all create very profitable blocks and the validators can, validators can choose between those blocks, but what if the validators themselves, they want to censor the network. They think that it's their mission to make sure that Ethereum is OFAC compliant. So what you have to recognize here is that there's two different ways that the validator can think about this, and there's two different forms of censorship. So the first one is that you basically just filter transactions, that the, the, the transactions that you include, you make sure that no OFAC compliance get into the chain. In this situation, even if 99.9% .9 of the validators do this, as long as one validator in the system does not do this, that transaction still gets in. So this is bad. I mean, 50% of the blocks in Ethereum being OFAC compliant is not a good thing, and we have to monitor that, monitor that and maybe we got to do something serious if it reaches 90%. But it's, there's one attack that is much, much worse which I call a censorship attack, which is where validators refuse to attest to blocks, other validators' blocks, if they include such transactions. So this, is a, this would result in a system-wide system censorship if validators decided to do this. And I think this is the one that we should treat equally as if it was a double spend on the network. If we see anyone doing reorg-style censorship in the network, that results in system-wide censorship, and that's what we really, really got to charge our uh, laser, <laughs> laser-eyed sharks for, right? This is, this is the most pernicious attack. I still don't think that it's a great thing that 50% of the blocks, and it's, it's, it's a rising figure, right? Two weeks ago it was 20%, 30%, now it's 50%. So we have to monitor that, and we can't let that number go too far. But I'm sort of willing to, um, like maybe there's different punishments for these two attacks. Like the first one, that's more benign in nature, Maybe you can uh, create a hard fork that only allows those validators to unstake their ether and basically ex exit the network. And it'll take them a couple of weeks. Take, it'll take them a couple of months. It's the red one here, the latter one, the second one, that is the one that we should treat equally as if it was double spend. And by the way, when I'm saying this, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm saying this, I recognize that you know I'm arbitrarily coming up with rules for slashing in Ethereum, and this is, shouldn't be something that's arbitrary. This is something that should be a policy that we all agree on. But we have to start somewhere. We have to come up with some sort of policy. I think that validators want to know like what is actually a slashable offense in this network, uh, a slashable offense in this network. So what we can do now is we can start to formulate the policy. We need to get together as a community. We need to see how we feel so we can understand like what's, what different routes are most likely to get system-wide consensus. So it doesn't make so much sense for me to say this is what we should do in this situation, this is what we should do in that situation, but 
the overarching element here is that we need to come up with some sort of policy so that validators understand what are the different punishments. So for example, uh, when, when uh, Coinbase or any other validator in the system th thinks about double spending, for example, they don't need to think about, okay, what, what happens if I double spend? They know, they know the punishment. And that's is something that now we're, we, we, this requires a social element, but we need to give them sort of similar deterrence so that they know what the punishment is. Now we have bought ourselves some time and I think it's, um, so this is the chief legal officer of Coinbase that says that their current in interpretation of the OFAC law is that, that there, there's nothing that compels them to apply any form of censorship on the base layer. This is good. But I don't think that it should be up to the interpretation of a single company or a couple of companies whether or not we have censorship in the network. We need to make the decision matrix for them look similar to what it does in the double spending case. Like there is no choice here. Like if you double spend, you lose your stake. You're no longer on the network. That's how it needs to, that's, that's how it needs to be for censorship also. So where are we currently with this? So in August I made a poll where I basically asked the Ethereum community to the extent that I could. So what do we do in the situation where, you know, Ethereum is basically being censored? Do we allow that to happen or do we slash, we burn the stakes of the validators that are making this happen on the Ethereum network? And it seems like currently the um, sort of, you know, the Twitter polls is not a great uh, thing to, to, to assess this, which is why I actually think that I want to be able to speak with you guys. I want to be, to be able to meet you in this conference here and ask you, what do you think that people think uh, about this issue and, you, and, you, and you're going to tell me, well, all of my friends think that, thinks that we should slash uh, system-wide censorship attacks, real slash censorship attacks, but we maybe should come to the, we maybe should do something different if it's just, you know, transaction filtering. So this is a discussion that needs to happen in Ethereum um, so that we can get a better grasp of what, what is actually, what is the consensus view on this. So, um, Ryan Sean Adams voted in this poll and he gave us this great logo for this result. So the, the, um, the uh, answer here to, to slash the validators got this symbol, the black flag. Instead of waving a white flag, you would wave a black flag, which means if there's censorship in Ethereum, we slash those motherfuckers. Hmm. So what is the black flag movement? The black flag movement is sort of a, just a movement of people that declare that they would be willing to go as far as to support a manual fork of the protocol that removes the stake of validators that engages in, in attempts to achieve system-wide censorship. Now, a lot of people get iffy around this. Like, oh, like, I don't want to slash Coinbase because they have retail users and it's ultimately their balances that would get slashed. But if you think about it, when, if Coinbase double spends, they get slashed. So there's not, there, like, it shouldn't really be an ethical question. We slash them when they double spend, we slash them when they censor. Like, that's not a, a controversial statement. Of course, it's more iffy in this situation because we're doing it in a more arbitrary way. We don't have uh, codified rules that execute this in, a, in an automated fashion. So we need to be a bit more humble about it, sure, but the ethical element to it should be sort of clear that we don't allow double spends, we don't allow censorship. So this is controversial, yeah, for sure. And this is one of the reasons that we can't expect, I don't think that you can sort of rely on your traditional leaders in Ethereum to be the primary spokespersons for this. Because imagine Vitalik saying, you know, we're gonna slash this validator, we're gonna slash that validator. Then we're just back to, you know, everyone criticizing us and saying, the overlords of Ethereum decides who gets to keep their stake or not. Like we don't, so this has to be in its nature. It was the same thing in Bitcoin. The Bitcoin core developers did not actually support the uh, user activated soft fork. They uh, took a back seat. Uh, they took, they took a, a back row seat in this discussion and allowed it to be a community driven initiative. So it's really us, it really comes down to us to push for, for this type of social slashing fork if that happens, because we cannot rely on our traditional leaders to do that because it just needs to be grassroots in order for, for it to be authentic. Now, if you're still like on the fence about this, like one thing that I want you to remember is that not even Swift 
Not even Swift applies OFAC regulations on the messages that are passed in their, in their, in their, on their network. Because they recognize that, so Swift is a cross-jurisdictional messaging system for banks. If you, if you have to abide by every single jurisdiction's OFAC laws and regulations, you cannot have a cross-jurisdictional uh, messaging layer. So this is a, you just can't, you, you can't uh, comply with every single jurisdiction at the same time, which, which is why you can't have s uh, network level censorship for a global uh, system. It just doesn't work. So not even Swift does this, and I don't think that Ethereum should be any worse than Swift. Um, there's just one last thing that I want to say here about this this image here. Um, it's this image uh, was generated by an, by by stable diffusion. So there's uh, GPUs that has rendered this image, and those GPUs are actually repurposed Ethereum miners. So those Ethereum miners that uh, used to secure Ethereum are now actually they're actually in this room with us, helping me tell this story. So they're still with us. Oh, by the way, I just have a, get to give a shout out to Nick Carter who um, helped me create this image. So he's not on Twitter anymore, but he's still, still also with us. <laughs> um, actually, that was, that was the end of my talk, so thank you very much. <laughs> I think we have some time for questions. Thanks uh, for the great talk, Eric. Really appreciated that. Uh, what do you think the risk is today for people to ignore the OFAC guidance? I mean, they could tell the ISPs to cut off our internet connection. Um, have you thought through other possibilities of what the governments may try to do if we don't comply with the request? Okay. Hello? Yeah, so I'm not an expert on that topic. Um, we seen, we've seen that Coinbase doesn't see it as, as their role to do anything on the validator level uh, to comply with OFAC. So they don't currently interpret the uh, law of the OFAC law that they have to apply any network level censorship. So I think you know it's a little bit weird that Flashbots thinks that they have to do it. Uh, I can't really speak to that. On the application side, uh, it gets more iffy. I think that for applications, I think that like DeFi applications maybe should not have like shouldn't be like incorporated in the U.S. Maybe if they want to, but actually there's another way that you can like if as long as you allow the smart contracts to run on Ethereum, anyone can build a front end to that, right? So that's a way that you can sort of get around that issue of of of, of um, you can have DeFi working and then you can have other entities create the front, end, front ends to those smart contracts. But I don't have a great answer to your question because it's not my area of expertise. Thank you. Um, hi, Eric. Um, first of all, let me congratulate you for the great job that you did uh, debunking that hex scam. I remember that video, <laughs> the Richard Hardy interview, amazing. I'm, I'm a professor myself here in Colombia at the main university. It's, uh, it's called the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. So I do a job that is similar, but trying to debunk scams. People love scams here in Colombia, so it's hard sometimes. But anyway, my question is, um, I don't know if you remember a few months ago that some transactions were censored um, for Venezuelan users through MetaMask. And that's before the, you know, the proof of stake Ethereum system. So is, is the same as, as, you, as you mentioned in your presentation? Yes, I, I think that I recall this also. And so my stance there is basically so private companies, what type of censorship that they apply to their business is really up to them. 
as long as it doesn't happen on the network level because you can still use another wallet like you can import your seed from export your seed from metamask into another wallet and access those funds and move them around even if you're a venezuelan everything that happens on the front ends uh, at the application layer uh, especially things that are like off chain is is like it's bad that companies do that and we should try to get them to adopt a more open approach but ultimately it's like network level censorship that's really the thing that we, that we need, to, need to focus on because someone can always build another wallet someone can always build another metamask so that's the only answer that i have to that question okay thank you last question real quick thank you eric <clears throat> thank you for bringing this excellent <clears throat> to devcon what's the obstacle of bringing the censorship resistant to the protocol level, what would be the obstacle of, especially on the validator related? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And there is a whole body of research that tries to, in an automated fashion, detect censorship and implement like slashing attacks, uh, slashing responses uh, in an automated fashion. I would say that the current, to my understanding, I'm not an expert in that either, but to my current understanding, there are partial solutions there are partial solutions that are still on the, you know, on the on the on the whiteboard. There's nothing. It, it, we should probably expect that even even these partial solutions will take a couple of years before we might see them integrated in the protocol level. So social slashing remains the primary defense mechanism for now. It might be such that we have automated ways, which would be much better, right? Because then it would be codified, automated, no subjectivity, no arbitrariness. So that's the goal, right? Uh, so that's an open research area. Uh, we might see advancements in that area uh, that come underway, um, but currently we still have to rely on this social element uh, where we are currently right now. That's it. Yes. Let's uh, thank Eric. Thank you seriously for your leadership on this issue. Uh, it's absolutely, I think we might look back in future years as this being the most important talk at this DevCon. Um, you know, I think the, the, all of the Ethereum community is, is grateful that, you, that you're leading on this. Um, or hopefully not. Um, and you know, because people get the idea and don't censor because they know they're gonna get slashed, we'll see.